Will you turn with me to the scriptures, please? To Luke chapter 18. I want to speak on two men in the temple. Two men in the temple. Luke chapter 18, please. Beginning to read at verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Will you bow where you are with me in a word of prayer? Eternal Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us your Son. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Thank you for your blood that you shed and your life that you gave. We thank you, Lord, you have left us your Holy Spirit. Lord, may he now move in this car park. May he move from seat to seat and heart to heart of those who are here. We thank you, Lord, for the many that you've brought out tonight. Lord, as our faces differ, so do our needs. But every need we believe is met in you alone. Glorify your name through the preaching of thy word. Help me to exalt you, to magnify you, to lift you up. And may you alone be seen. Would you hide this man of flesh and blood behind the cross? And Lord, may you receive the glory tonight. Save souls. Restore the backslidden. Heal bodies. Heal minds. And heal hearts. We wait on you. We need you. We love you. Jesus' name we pray and ask it, Father. Amen. In this short reading tonight, we have short points, and I promise you they are short. And the first one we'll find is the persuaded, the persuaded in heart. And then we will see the persons, the persons. And then we will see the power. Then the prayer, and then we will see the plea, then the pardon, and the punishment. Very analytical tonight, I know, but maybe help us to remind ourselves of these points. First of all, we see the persuaded, the persuaded in heart. In verse 9, and he, the Lord Jesus, Speak this parable unto certain, notice unto certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Here we have the persuaded. They trusted in themselves. The word for trusted is a Greek word, pytho, and it means to be persuaded, fully persuaded, Completely persuaded, utterly and totally persuaded. And here we have the Lord Jesus speaking unto certain. He was speaking unto those who were persuaded in their hearts. 
that they were righteous. In other words, they were in right standing with God. That they believed in their heart without a doubt. That they knew that they were right with God. And yet, they did not trust in the works of God for their salvation. Am I speaking tonight to a man or to a woman and you're not saved? You might go to church. You might believe your denomination is all that saves you. You might believe you're a good enough person, even though the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. And you're persuaded in your heart, fully persuaded, completely persuaded that you are righteous that you're in right standing with the Lord, that should your breath be taken from you this moment, that when you stand before God, you'll find that you, being persuaded now in this life in your heart, that you will be in God's glory, that you will be in God's kingdom, that you will be in God's heaven. Am I speaking to a man or to a woman tonight, is the Spirit of God speaking, pointing out to you, are you really right with God? What makes a man and a woman righteous before God? Is it your good works, your church, your doings, your alms, your deeds, your good living? Friend, I can tell you, there's no righteousness no righteousness outside the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no righteousness in your works, in your giving, or in your living. The only righteousness that we can have is to believe with all of our hearts and accept that Christ has died for us and that his blood has paid the debt of our sin and that his blood has cleansed us even as Leon has sang about earlier. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. That and in that alone is the cleansing power for the forgiveness of our sin. The righteousness of Christ is placed upon the repentant man and woman. The great transaction was made at Calvary's tree. He bearing our sins in his own body on the tree. And we taking his righteousness, who alone is righteous, and so we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so he tells that there's two men go to the temple to pray. And he's speaking to certain people who believe they are righteous outside of him. Christ kept the law of God that we could not keep. Christ lived the life that we could not live. And he died as our substitute, the death we should have died, separated from his father, so we would be separated from God forever. And there he's in our place on Calvary's tree. That when we believe in him and place our trust in him only, solely, totally, fully, uniquely, and completely relying in nothing or no one else, let alone ourselves, then we receive forgiveness of sins, repenting, turning from our ways, and facing God, and crying for mercy, as we have read in our reading tonight. Note this, speaking to certain, they trusted in themselves. They were persuaded in their own hearts and sinful, depraved nature. 
that man could be right with God. And that still is in the nature of man and woman this evening, that many believe being dead in our trespasses, dead toward God that is, and in our sins, that we can be righteous and that we will enter God's heaven. Notice this, the word here persuaded, fully persuaded, completely and utterly persuaded and nothing can move the man, the woman. Nothing can change the heart but the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God who moves in a life the Holy Spirit of God who touches, who quickens, regenerates the man and the woman to realize their need of salvation, putting their faith in Christ. This word here, persuaded, let me give you an idea of the strength of pytho, of the persuasion here. For example, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and in verse 8, He's, verse 8 and verse 20, pardon me, chapter 8 and verse 28. For I am persuaded, notice Paul, fully persuaded in Christ, completely taken over and yielded by Christ. Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul was fully persuaded that Christ was enough. Paul was fully, completely, totally and utterly persuaded that Christ's finished work on the cross was sufficient and that nothing, past, present, future, spiritual or physical, was able to separate him from the love of God which was in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. What a blessed assurance you can have this evening if you're not saved, that you've never put your trust in him. What a blessed assurance of the believer who can say with Paul that even if I die, my body goes to the grave. Even if I die, the blood of Christ still speaks for me and the Spirit of God hath sealed me unto the day of the fullness of my redemption. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you say that tonight? Are you assured of that tonight? Or are you one of the certain who are persuaded that you're good enough without the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in him? In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, the apostle says, For I know whom I have believed. Speaking of Christ, for I know whom I have believed. Listen, and I'm persuaded. It's the same word. Fully, completely, totally and utterly persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Being fully persuaded that your security, your eternal welfare is in the hands of the Father and of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that your eternal welfare is sealed in blood, the blood which flowed from Emmanuel's veins. One brief scripture, if you would, 
I'd like to turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, please. And notice this verse right down to the very end of the chapter. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came from the loins of the seed of Abraham through the virgin Mary, born and birthed, conceived of the Holy Ghost. He took on him of the seed of Abraham. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things that behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, he became, and he came in the likeness, not in sinful flesh, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. You see, Christ is the spotless lamb. He is the sinless lamb of God. He is the impeccable son of God. Not only he did no sin, he knew no sin, he was yet without sin, the scriptures tell us, but it tells us something of him. His impeccability meant he could not sin because he is God revealed to us in the person of his son. He is God Almighty revealed and clothed and robed and manifest in the flesh. And he came as a seed of Abraham. Notice this. To be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God. Now take note of this. Why? Why was he made like unto his brethren? Because he would be a merciful and faithful high priest. You see, the high priest was taken from among men. He was a man from among men, chosen and picked from the tribe of Levi, from the house of Aaron. And when he was picked, he was a man who could not only sympathize with the humanity, but he could empathize and enter in to all of the suffering. Because he was a man. And here Christ not only sympathized, but he empathizes with us. For we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin, saith the Scriptures. Christ as man, he completely understands me. He understands the weakness of humanity. He felt the hunger and the thirst. He felt the tiredness and he felt the pain of the nails in his hands and his feet and the Roman flagellum whip upon his back and the crown of thorns on his head. He felt it all, friend. As man, he understands me. But as God, he knows me. He knows my every sin, my every failure, and yours as well. And the God-man Christ Jesus died on the cross. Now note this. Our merciful and faithful high priest, that he might make reconciliation for the sins of his people, for that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. The word here, to reckon merciful, means not just to show mercy, but the word merciful here, it is the same word. To reconcile us. That Christ, we can place our full persuasion because he knows us. And the word means he came to be merciful to make reconciliation between the sinner and his father. And so hence he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So we have the persuaded. Now there are two men, the persons next. The two men 
are a Pharisee and a publican. A Pharisee and a publican. That's the two persons, the two men who go to the temple to pray. In our reading in Luke 18 and verse 10, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now these Pharisees, it is believed that the Pharisees didn't actually come to the fore until after the house of Judah or the Jews came out of Babylonian captivity. And when they came out, and we read of Ezra and Nehemiah building the walls in the temple, Zerubbabel's temple, we read of that when they had come out of the captivity. And through that time, it is believed the Pharisees added till they had rabbinical teachings of the Midrash and other writings that were laying and putting upon the people 613 commandments for salvation. And when Christ comes along, he says unto them, search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He says, you're searching the scriptures. Forget about the rabbinical teaching. The Babylonian Talmudic teaching had come in to the religion and the Hebraic Israelites teaching had been done away with long ago by these people and so they were sinful before God. The righteous in themselves keeping the washing of pots and pans, thinking they're doing God justice and service to make themselves holy and righteous. That's the sort of man, the person that Christ was talking about. Oh, we do not get it today in many circles where it's the ritual. It's the ritual. It's the confirmation. It's the christening. It's people take their child to a christening maybe once in their lifetime. And it's as though they're saved. Friends, salvation is a free gift of God. It's not at a christening nor a confirmation. It's not in a mass. And it's not in rosary beads. And it's not a bowing at an altar nor a statue. But rather, it's in the Holy Ghost quickening the sinner to see the Lamb of God. Believing in all their, with all their heart that they're a sinner and Christ is the only Savior. Neither is there salvation in any other, Peter says. Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, there's no name will save you. No priest. No pope. No pontiff. No pastor. None can save you. But Christ and Christ alone. Here these persons, this Pharisee, this Pharisee is self-righteous and the publican isn't a man who owns a pub. It isn't a man who owns a bar. The publicans were hated, despised, despicable men who took taxes of those in Judea and took the taxes of the layman and woman and almost robbed them blind, came like the debt collector, threatening with them. The Romans thought they were nothing but rubbish in society. And the Jews hated them even more. Two men went to pray. That's the type of persons that came to the temple. Two men went to pray. Notice this, my friends. Brother, sister, read with me, please. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Thirdly, here is the power persuaded, the persons, the power. What is the power? It's found in the word temple. Now they went to the temple and yet people think they were right in the direct presence of God. No, they weren't. 
The word here for temple is the word hieron. Hieron. And it's like when you go to church, the building, the bricks, the stone, the metal, the wood, the actual edifice is the hieron. It spoke of the whole precincts of all the temple. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ never went to the inner temple sanctuary? Never once. He went into the temple, the Huron, and he whipped out the money changers. He walked in the temple, it says, the Huron. So preacher, you must be wrong. The Bible says he was in the temple. He was in the precincts of the Huron. But he never once went in to where Paul tells us, know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The word there is the naos. You see, we have the outer precincts and the outer court. And then you go by one curtain into the holy place. Then the holy of holies through the second veil. And there was the ark of the covenant. And there the glory cloud came down. That is the naos where the presence of the living God came down in reality and in power. And only the high priest could enter once a year. And he had to enter with blood. Christ never walked there because by now it was defiled. It was despicable. And it was a putrid cesspit. And Christ was the temple of the living God. Christ himself said, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up again. And they crucified him outside the city walls. Oh, Jerusalem became the unholy city when they put Christ outside the city walls and crucified him. Notice this. Paul says, know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That is, the temple is the naos, that when you're saved, the Holy Spirit quickens the dead, makes them alive. They're drawn to Christ. Maybe he's doing that with someone tonight, speaking to you. And you realize you need him. You realize you must repent. And you realize you must turn from the world and your ways. And face God and ask for mercy. The Holy Spirit lives in you. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the naos, Paul says. The naos of God, believer. But note this. They go to the power. This man was looking at religious power. Ceremonial power. 613 commandment power. Dead, lifeless power, nothing in it. But God was watching to see whether he would come to him because it takes the power of God to raise the dead, friend. Dead in his self-righteousness. Dead in himself. And it takes the power of the living God to save you. So we have the power. They go to the temple. They pray. Notice the prayer here. You let your eye run down to verse 11, please. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. Note the term, within himself. I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Thank you, Lord, I'm not like him. Self-righteous. I'm so glad I'm not like him. Notice this. The prayer is this of the, of the Pharisee. It was private because it was within himself. Within himself. You see, friend, God knows the thoughts of the heart. God knows the thoughts of your mind. God knows the wicked thoughts. God knows... The worrying thoughts, 
God knows the anxious thoughts. God knows the troublesome thoughts of the heart. But this man's heart was pompous. It was a private, pompous prayer of a Pharisee. Self-righteous, despising the publican. Note here, he says, I thank thee that I am not as other men. This prayer, by the time this man had left the temple, had damned him. <clears throat> it had damned him. Be careful how you leave tonight in the thoughts of your heart without Christ. For what if you never hear the voice of God? What if God stops striving? Or God forbid something happen? Notice here, friends. <clears throat> Notice this, verse 12. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all I possess. That's very good. Nothing wrong with that. But the man's self-righteous. Verse 13, and the publican standing afar off would not lift so much as his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I see this word merciful. Again, this word merciful means, will you reconcile me to yourself? There's different words in the original text for merciful. This one means, oh God, would you reconcile me to yourself again? Notice the publican, this hated man, the plea, God be merciful. That's his plea. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And this plea was a plea of repentance. It was a plea that would bring salvation. Notice here, friends, in verse 14. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Notice. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other. There's the pardon. He was pardoned. How do you know the word justified? It means this man went down declared righteous. Here's the Pharisee. I do all this. I keep all these commandments. I go by the Mishnah and the Midrash and all these teachings and I go along with them and I wash pots and pans. Look how good I am, O oh God. I tithe and, and I give all what I possess and you know I'm a good man. Enough for you to accept me and my works. Self-righteous. The publican comes and he says, <laughs> I'm the worst of society. I'm the chiefest of sinners, as it were. Go, God, be merciful. Reconcile me to you. That was the plea, and the pardon comes. This man went down to his house justified. There's the pardon. Just as if he had never sinned. He went down to his house and right standing before God. I'm rounding this up. This pardon was glorious. Christ gives, gives us the, the picture of salvation and damnation. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The self-righteous Pharisee was not justified, only in his own eyes. Ah, that preacher down in that drive-in, he's too harsh. That preacher down in that drive-in, he says it, and he doesn't care what he says, and he's, he's offensive, and he's hurtful, and I think he's a bit too much, friend, that's fine. And that's okay. And if people say that, that's all right. I hear it on a regular basis. But I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love your soul enough to tell you the truth. 
If you were to come here and I was to give you little fanciful fairy tale stories and illustrations and you went home and died in your sin, I would stand before God one day and I will give an answer. And there's many men who will. This Pharisee, how do we know he was damned? How do we know? It doesn't say it. It just says one went down justified, the other didn't. Well, let's see what Jesus says as we close this. Will you turn with me? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. We haven't time to go through these. But I'm just going to pick a verse or two out about the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23, verse 8. Pardon me, verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees. Notice he calls them hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he goes on, Christ gives eight woes here. Seven of them are directly, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And there's one in verse 16, woe unto you, ye blind guides. Whosoever shall swear by the temple, this is this Pharisee who's crying, the temple, the temple, the temple. Friends, and I can tell you, many evangelicals are crying it again, looking for a temple. Friend, I'm not looking for a temple. I'm looking for Christ. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God from heaven. Many of them will shout and cry for the temple. It is nothing, he says. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Notice, ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift of the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Notice, and he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And he goes on to their works again. Is there someone like that tonight? You think your salvation is in your gifts and in your church? The Roman church say there's no salvation outside of it. I can tell you, there's no salvation in it. There's no salvation but in Christ. Woe we'll unto you, verse 25. Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, and within they are full of extortion and excess. You're rotten, he says. Rotten to the core. Verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you are like on the whitest sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. He's saying you look the part. There's many are dressed in their robes and their day gone fish miter hats with their, their staffs and their crooks and they're looking the part with their gowns and their ceremonies and they're dead. They're lifeless. They're Christless. They're godless. And there's no salvation in them. They're like tombs full of dead men's bones. Look at verse 32. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, 
Jesus said this. That's not very Christian, you saying that today. Jesus said it. It's the word of God. He said to these Pharisees, He said it to those who are in high ecumenical places, those who are high church men without Christ, leading millions to hell. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape, listen, the damnation of hell? Friend, how could you escape the damnation of hell? That's the words of Christ. So two men in the temple. One went away damned, but the other went away justified, saved, trusting, repenting, and believing. Friend, are you saved tonight? Are you born again of the Spirit? Are you Christ's? Are you Christ's? Are you blood washed? If you're not saved, or you've fallen away, and you realize I'm not right with God, I'm going to stand as I do every meeting at the corner. There's been many people have come and we have pointed them to Christ throughout these. Believe it or not, this is our 38th week here. 38 weeks. God has allowed us here to preach his word and to witness for his glory. And souls have been saved. And if you're not saved, don't leave like that Pharisee tonight. Oh, you don't know what my life has been. I don't need to know what your life has been. You come repenting to Christ, not to me. You come repenting at the cross. And him that cometh unto me, he says, I will in no wise cast out. One wee line to encourage you, friend. Oh, I'm a great sinner. Listen. He's still the friend of sinners. This man sitteth with sinners and and publicans, they said of him. Thank God he came and died for us. Publicans and sinners. May God bless his word to our hearts tonight. For Jesus' name's sake.